Welcome back to the Catholic Northman. Today I'm doing something a little bit different. Um, and I want to give a shout out to one of my viewers, KD and fellow Trad Cat. Uh, thanks for the suggestion. I'm just going to do a little bit more off the cuff thing today. When I'm talking about the strange case of John Tetzel. So John Tetzel was a Dominican friar who lived in the 16th century. He was a par excellence preacher. He was alive at the same time as Martin Luther. So this story has a few characters in it. John Tetzel, who's the protagonist. Martin Luther, who's the antagonist. Uh, the Bishop of Mainz in Germany who is an antagonist in a certain kind of way, and a papal nuncio, or rather a um, representative of the Pope, who is also an antagonist. It seems kind of strange. We, we talk about the unity of the church, but there's always been a Judas, and throughout the centuries, Judases have multiplied in the church, not just outside of it. And we get, we get this case of a man who is holy and is trying to do his best to do his duty, is being head-to-head -head with Martin Luther, at the same time being kicked down by his fellow Catholics that are in high-ranking positions. And we can be sure that money has a lot to do with this because this story takes place at the time of the Reformation, when indulgences were a hot topic. The sale of indulgences for the building of St. Peter's Basilica was something that happened. But there's often a lack of understanding of what indulgences actually are. It's not you buy your way into heaven. That's not what it's about. I am not going to explain that here. Um, there's, if you really want to dig into it and understand what it is, what an indulgence is, why people um, paid sums of money to obtain them sometimes, and you couldn't always obtain them, what, what that actually means and what that represents. There's plenty of documentation out there if you want to dig and try and find it yourself. The story, though, and I'll read a little bit from this book. The, the book is called St. Dominic's Family. So it's a book of several different people who were Dominicans and this one just happened to catch my eye for some reason because sometimes you just open up a book like this that has you know two or three hundred different characters in it and one just catches your eye out of the table of contents and this one happened to you and it reminded me a lot the story reminded me a lot of things that happen nowadays um, with this left right conflict that's going on in the world and you see similar tactics being deployed by Martin Luther um, that the left uses today. So I'll read a little bit here. All the bitterness of the Reformation had been heaped upon the unlucky head of John Tetzel, the man who ran afoul of Martin Luther. The records indicate that he was not deserving of most of the uh, opprobrium. I think I pronounced that incorrectly. But he happened to be on hand when a scapegoat was needed. The Dominican order at least should uphold the reputation of this man. He did his best to testify to the truth in an impossible situation. So it goes a little bit into his life and his, um, I guess, accomplishments or education. Uh, he was born in 1460, received his bachelor's degree in, Le in Leipzig, and he entered the Dominican order after he was already known as a good scholar. He was, he was very intelligent. He was well-learned. He probably came from money uh, to, be able to, get an, to, to be able to get an education like that. And then he entered into the Dominican order. So right there, that says a lot about somebody, right? He could have just had a nice, easy life. Probably, you know, he, he had a bachelor's degree already. Probably came from money, I'm assuming. And he decided to forsake all of that and go into the Dominican order. Now, the story goes that 
so when you, the sale of indulgences was happening, um, the Pope was was selling indulgences to raise money to build St. Peter's Basilica, which is what you see when you go to Rome today. But money was shifting hands a lot more than that. There was a program going on in Germany at the time where the Bishop of Mainz was trying to raise money to build new churches or, or renovate older churches. And he was in he was in serious debt to money lenders in Germany in the 16th century. So the Pope tried to bail him out and it got publicized that this happened and um, it, it just gave fuel to Martin Luther's fire about the sale of indulgences and certain Catholic beliefs. Martin Luther precipitated this this tragedy that soon got out of hand. He turned his scorn and his eloquence against the Archbishop of Mainz, and he was particularly bitter against the Dominican who had been appointed to preach the indulgences in Germany, the popular preacher John Tetzel. Once this scandal, quote-unquote, got out of hand, the Pope was trying to bail the, the, Ger the German bishop out from the money lenders that he'd gotten himself into. At the same time, John Tetzel was there preaching, Martin Luther turned his attention both towards the bishop and to John Tetzel. Tetzel, although he was a popular extempore preacher, was no mean theologian. He had written a book, The Duties of Preachers of Indulgences, which gives proof that he understood and promulgated the orthodox teaching on indulgences, and neither regarded them as pardons for sin, nor as commodities for sale, both of which were Luther's accusations. He states unequivocally that the sinner is obliged to repent and go to confession before he can gain any indulgence, and that the church holds as Catholic truths a number of things not explicitly found either in the Old or New Testament, since tradition and oral teaching are more ancient than scripture. These two arguments brought him into head-on conflict with Luther, who had, in a few months, become a Bible-thumping zealot beyond reach of reasoning. So the heat is, gets turned up. John Tetzel, an eloquent preacher, is probably turning heads and people that were starting to listen to Martin Luther are probably starting to listen to him now too. Martin Luther is getting more fired up. No, you can only rely on the Bible. That's the only thing you can rely on. No, no. Well, anybody with a common piece of logic in their brain can see that the Bible came from tradition. So... If it came from tradition, then we also have to hold tradition as something sacred if it, if it is true. But things escalated anyways. And this is where it starts getting a little bit where it resembles what's going on in certain debates and arguments in politics and in the church itself going on today with corruption and whatnot. So the followers of Luther were fanatically devoted to him and the united in the cry death to Tetzel yeah that's right death yeah it's hard to understand today since the authority they were it's hard to understand today this is funny I'm reading a book that was probably published in 1950s and it's not hard to understand today because we see this happening on the left where anytime somebody makes a stand like that Remember that kid there a few months back uh, with the MAGA hat on, the, the Catholic boy there from the Catholic school? The, there was, what was her name there? Kathy, that stupid ginger comedian there, uh, wanted to dox this kid. Now, I didn't know what the heck the word doxing meant at the time. I really don't keep up with all of these new terms. But I looked it up and... And what happens next in the story sounds a lot like doxing. I mean, starting with death to Tetzel. The guy is just there trying to do his job. He's not, you know, anybody that's rich or he, he's given up that lifestyle so that he can become somebody holy. And at the same time, we've got a more probably corrupt characters in the church that maybe deserve to have their att the attention focused on them a little bit more. But no, it's death to Tetzel because... He's turning followers of Luther away and back to the church again. 
The Dominican rapidly became the butt of all their sarcasm and their insults and threats on his life made it difficult for him to move around. In the midst of the trouble, Tetzel fell seriously ill in Leipzig. When he was summoned to go to Altenburg by the priest that the Pope had sent to settle the matter, now this is the nuncio, uh, he could not get out of bed. The priest wrote to Tetzel, repeating the accusations of Luther against him. You have been denounced as a heretic and a blasphemer and as having insulted the Blessed Virgin. Tetzel replied, I know that Brother Martin is obsessed with that idea, but I am sure that I can prove it to you that I am a faithful son of Holy Church and that I have sacrificed my own reputation and security in the cause of truth. His superior likewise wrote to this nuncio, attesting that Tetzel was too ill to go to Altenburg. He added, I do not know any other man who has done and suffered as much as Tetzel in the defense of the Holy See. The nuncio, for some reason of his own, sided against Tetzel. I'm guessing money had something to do with it here. It seemed to have been a rampant problem at the time. He went to Leipzig to see the Dominican and denounced him to his face. The dying man felt that this was the ultimate desertion that the church for which he had suffered so much would turn against him. He died in the bleakness of misunderstanding before any decisive steps could be taken. The ensuing years have blackened his memory with a great many things that he did not say or do, though unprejudiced historians today admit that much of the uh, opprobrium was simply the bitterness of the age. It had nothing to do with him personally. Well, that's... Uh, Comforting to know that at least we know that it wasn't him personally. Well, I, I guess, but in a way it probably was because, like I said, he was probably, if he was that eloquent of a preacher, if he was that good at it, and if we can assume from his lifestyle that he gave up riches to become a holier person, I would think that he was turning people back from Luther. And that's, yet yeah, was personally against him. I have to disagree with the, the author or the person who compiled this book for the, just that one thing, because uh, that poor man, you know, <laughs> like he, like right to his face on his deathbed, like that must, that must've made him sick. That must've hit him pretty, pretty hard there. And, and this is the kind of, who knows he's not sainted or or been ble uh, declared blessed or venerable or anything like that he's just in this book of someone of note of history maybe it's worth our while to say a few prayers for the guy because it seems like he did a lot maybe he's already there i don't know yeah i i kind of feel in a sense that he probably if you can just take a look at his lifestyle he probably was a martyr of sorts and the kind of martyr that that dies at low that that dies a slow, long, lingering, and painful death, and suffers much for the truth. Not just a quick blow, and that's it. Your life is over. But I think he was a martyr of that type. This is the longest I've blabbed about anything in a long time. Hopefully, you stuck it through all the way to the end. Thank you once again, KD. And I hope that this reaches people and helps in some way, shape, or form. This is the Catholic Northman. I'll talk to you again soon.